This is one of the hardest things I ever do. I'm really glad Justina is standing behind me because she's, <laughs> she's so strong. My body says this is a survival situation. But I've been wanting to share this story with you since Wednesday night. And I might tell you most of it with my eyes closed. Sometimes I forget to ask for help. And then sometimes I remember to ask for help. And it comes. So I want to tell you about some everyday ministers that were sent to me. Um, I struggled with depression since I was about nine. Struggle's not really the right word now, but I've experienced it much of my life for more than 30 years. Um, but it wasn't until last October that the day came where I began to contemplate the various ways I might leave my body. Because I had come to the realization or the supposed realization that me being who I am in this world as it is, is just too painful. And so very calmly, I just decided, yeah, I just need to go. And I thought, well, I need, to get, I need about two or three weeks to get some things in order for my beautiful husband. So I can't quite do it yet. And Sweden's very progressive. They have assisted suicide programs. Maybe I could go over there and they could help me do it in such a way that all my organs could be used to save other lives. So it was this very strange, irrational, rational, calm conversation I was having with myself. And miraculously, Life and I have conspired to make me a person that can perform even when I want to leave. And so I dragged myself into my vehicle, my husband's vehicle actually, and I drove to see a man um, in home health. I'm an occupational therapist. I see people in home health. And I was seeing people in the hills of Tennessee that had very few resources and were very sick. And my coworkers had said, this man, his phone is not working, so you'll just have to show up. And you'll knock on the door and he probably won't answer, so you just go in. <laughs> and his house is a trailer at the end of the black top down this country road, just go to the end and park. And so I'm making this whole journey and I'm I'm like, I need help. Can I have some help, please? And how in the world am I driving this truck right now? But I drove to the end of the blacktop and I found the trailer and I was like, okay, I guess this is it. And I walk to the door and I knock on the door. I'm like, oh, no answer. And I knock louder and there's still no answer. Knock a third time, even louder. No answer. So I'm like, oh, this is the Wild West. I'm just going to go in to this person who I've never seen before. 
And all I knew about him is that he was 34 years old and he had recently had his leg amputated because he had unmanaged diabetes and he had three preteen or teenage daughters that he was taking care of. His partner had left him. So I open the door and I start calling his name and I see him in a recliner, apparently has no shirt on and he's sleeping soundly. I'm like, great. So I keep calling his name, he doesn't answer. I get louder. I'm still feeling very tentative about entering this space. I'm like, this is it. I'm just going to go over, and I'm still calling his name. He's not rousing. I know he's alive. Um, and he's still not answering to me, yelling his name. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to find the leg he still has, and I'm going to touch it. And I don't know how he's going to wake up or what his response is going to be. And he's been through so much. And so I grab his leg and call his name. And ah! I'm like, I'm so sorry. I was told I should just come in. I hope this is okay. And he was the nicest, kindest, most beautiful man. And he just beamed. And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, totally. Come on in. It's about 11 a.m. He was like, I'm sorry. I had a bad night. I didn't sleep very much. So I spent the next 45 minutes with him, asking him how is he taking care of himself? Is he able to bathe? Is he able to get food? And he's just making jokes about his leg. I was like, oh, I don't, I don't want to get too close to you. He's like, all right, I don't have a leg there. You can come up even closer. <laughs> he's making jokes about going to the IHOP with his daughter. <laughs> And I'm getting chills as I'm talking to him, and I'm like, wow, look at you. And it, it didn't feel like an indictment either. You know, I didn't reflect on, I'm in so much pain with both legs and my health. I just saw his joy and his acceptance. And I said, you're amazing. It's like, you've been through so much. How are you like this? He's like, I don't know. My mom says I just go along no matter what happens. I'm like, okay, well, thank you. And I get in the truck and I drive to the local co-op to get some lunch and I'm in my scrubs. And I go to the hot bar and there's an old man there going through the hot bar and I decide I don't want what's first, I want something down the line. So I go down the line and I realize I'm going the wrong way in the line, you know. And so I say to the old man, I hope I'm not cramping your style. And he said, my style is uncrampable. <laughs> and I'm getting the chills I got then. And I said, that's the best thing I've ever heard. <laughs> and then we look at each other and he's like, oh, do you work in healthcare? And I'm like, yeah, I work in home health. I'm an occupational therapist. And he said, I love my occupational therapist. <laughs> and he pulls up his pant leg and shows me his catheter bag by the food bar. <laughs> and I'm here for it. I'm here for it. <laughs> and he starts telling me, he's like, oh, this catheter has been so traumatic for me. It's been so painful. And he starts telling me the details. I'm like, yeah, yeah. And I, I'm grimacing as he's telling me how painful it's been to have it taken in and out periodically. And he gets a foot away from my face and puts both his hands and fist and puts them next to my temples and he says, I can see the empathy. Mm. And he says, I love you. I can't make this stuff up. <laughs> and he says, you know, some people go to the yoga studio and they're on the mat and everything is coming down and it's all. He's like, but for the rest of us, we just have to keep dancing. 
<laughs> and I'm starting to become cognizant of all the other <laughs> entitled white people walking around us being like, what is happening? Can I just get to the food bar? <laughs> but I'm just having such a good time talking to this, what we would call demented man <laughs> in the middle of the grocery store. We talk for a little while longer and I have a longing just to be in his life and to connect with him more, but something doesn't ask for his name, I don't ask for his contact information, and I'm just thankful for the moment with him. And I was like, well, I'm on the clock, I've, I've gotta go. And he's like, oh, I love you. <laughs> he says it again, like affirming my sense of responsibility. And so I left and I realized that it's, it's the darkest times. It's the times where I want to leave. I just ask for help. And just wait one more day. And the everyday ministers are there. And you're an everyday minister. So there's refugia in the middle of a grocery store talking about catheters, <laughs> if that's what'll do it for you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>